Sadly, many others will try to make it more uh, digestible to you. And in the process, there's a lot of compromises. Those compromises will not help you get closer to Allah. They will not help you establish the religion. They will not help the ummah get back on its feet. And all of the problems and, and, and calamities that befall us uh, in different nations and, and, and they materialize in different ways are nothing but a byproduct of our abandonment Sahih. of our religion Sahih. and that truth. Sahih. So we have to just man up basically. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'ad. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdata min lisani yafqa wa qawri. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, welcome back to another episode of MXP, the Muslim Experience Podcast. Today, alhamdulillah, we have a very, very, very special guest of us. It's our brother Abu Mus'ab. Uh, assalamu alaykum, Shaykh Haydin. Wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan habibi, da'wa man himself. Hayakallah. Abu Mus'ab himself. You're the legend. <laughs> You're the legend. <laughs> yeah, people. I've always been myself, which is a problem for many people. <laughs> Allah barik. Just to bring people up to speed, uh, who may be kind of, you know, seeing you for the first time. Um, Brother Abu Mus'ab, mashallah, has been involved in the da'a for a very long time, Allah barik. Very long time. Before even... Um, I started, and I started almost a decade ago. And I remember, subhanAllah, mm. when I just started uh, practicing, and I was coming to the D, and we used to see your videos, One Path Network. Mashallah. And uh, mashallah, Aqeedah al and you know, yeah. you know, there was always. The like, one way to paradise. One way to paradise. One, one, one path, path, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What was yeah. One Path Network? What's that? Oh, that's something. There's else, another one. There's a similar one, yeah. Else. One way to paradise. After. It, Yes, yeah, when we, I'm glad I corrected that. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, that's, <laughs> it. I just, that's a big correction. It's very good. <laughs> Barakallah feek. Yeah, alhamdulillah, we used, to, we used to watch it. And I remember the brothers always pass it around. And I remember whenever there was like a shubha, and when there was always a doubt with regards to a particular group, there would always be a video that you had on the issue of hadith hey. projectors, on the issue of this group, that group. There was always something there, Allah And um, alhamdulillah, you had, you, had, you had a lot of efforts. So, brother Abu Musa, mashallah, has been, mashallah, Calling people to, towards the Sunnah of the Prophet Ali Sassam for very long time, Sassam. mashallah, very long time, and um, he was one of the the brothers who, in the English language, led the way towards you know at least on some kind of a popular level, um, it, 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 it exposing these modern day progressive Muslims that kind of you know they cloak themselves in orthodox Sunni uh, Salafi kind of you know words and and projections, but actually they have. Uh, kind of hidden agendas and hidden beliefs. Um, so, okay. and you got a lot of a lot of slack for that. You know, at the beginning, I remember. You know, and until you, now, until, until now, <laughs> it but doesn't it, end. But, it but, doesn't but at end. the beginning, it must it must have been even harder, Sheikh, because you were the only one. I, I know, I know, there were other people that were doing refutations, no doubt. Um, but your ones were kind of going out there. They were going viral. They were being shared. Um, so Sheikh, how, how, what, what, what was that like? Just if we just begin with that, you know, what was it like? You know, being like one of the only people at the forefront on a popular level to be getting your videos going that far. You're calling people to the Sunnah, and you've got these Sufi, Ashari, Ikhwani type of guys. They're talking all sorts of nonsense. How was that, Sheikh? Alhamdulillah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Muhammad. I think you've put it uh, pretty accurately uh, so far. Uh, the truth is, Akhi, this was uh, this was a, a byproduct. Of, of giving da'wah. <coughs> uh, as, as you know, and as any one of us who's involved in da'wah knows, um, it is not uh, a target that you per se search for uh, entering the, the, the field of al-radd ala al-mukhalif and, and refuting the opposers and the opponents and the people that are against the sunnah. That is what happens when you give da'wah. Uh, otherwise, you're, you're probably not giving proper da'wah. Mm -hmm. you're, you're giving some form of da'wah, maybe closer to missionary uh, Christian uh, approach to da'wah. Uh, you might be pampering people and giving them happy stories, bedtime stories, so they can have a good night's sleep. But if you're really going to give da'wah as the, as the MBA and the Rusul did, then you have to face difficulty, you have to face opposition, you have to face hatred, you have to face people calling you names, accusing you of being, uh, uh, you know, a magician or <laughs> a poet <laughs> or a person of, of yeah, crazy. You have jealousy issues. You have psychological issues. It's your, it's a, it's the same. Yeah. So what, when you enter the area, the field of da'wah and you try to call people to the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu in a time when the sunnah is not practiced popularly among the Muslims. And I don't mm. think anyone can deny that. Even yeah. people that disagree with us will confess and admit that the Sunnah is to some degree foreign. Mm -hmm. It's foreign to, to the Muslims. 
there's no way you're going to avoid uh, the fact that you will have to highlight mm -hmm. uh, some serious errors. And the reason why I say serious errors because you're not really looking just for mistakes out there. And, and the conversation we will have with each other, inshallah, I'm sure people can pinpoint and pull out uh, 10, 20, 30 mistakes, slip of a tongue, uh, uh, maybe a misquotation. This, subhanallah, this is, this is Bani Adam, the son yeah. of Adam. But when we highlight serious issues, serious errors that if not addressed and if not clarified, will confuse the Muslims about their belief in, in Islam, about mm -hmm. their belief in Allah, about the Sunnah of the Prophet So uh, how you go about it uh, varies, but at the end of the day, some group of people must carry the, the banner of uh, refuting those who go against the way of the righteous, righteous predecessors. Sahih. It's, uh, people have a problem with that, then you have a problem with the fundamentals of the religion, because if we were to quote the ulama, this is from the usul al-deen. Al-amr bil-ma'ruf wa nahan al-munkar. And this is one materialization, one, one uh, embodiment of al enjoining what is good, forbidding what is evil, is that you have to tell the people, hey, this is an evil. And this person is calling the people publicly to it. So I have to pub publicly make it clear. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, Shaykh, the dirt, what, I but, what I find astounding is that when people have a concept with when the people have an issue with the whole concept of refuting evil and clarifying evil, like in the shahadatain, in 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 kalimatul ikhlas, la ilaha illallah, you cannot enter Islam unless you have denounced all other false gods and all other false religions. La ilaha is is an absolute refutation, a negation, a freeing yourself of anything and everything. That is worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then affirmation for Allah. People only want to bring about the affirmation. They say, teach the sunnah, teach the read, but don't refute bid'ah, don't refute shirk. And it's people. But it doesn't make any sense because you can't become Muslim except without a with a except without a negation and a falsification and a nullification of all the other false beliefs. Even the Prophet والسلام, he said, Whoever comes with La ilaha illallah, wa kafara bima yu'badu min dunillah. And then he disbelieves in everything that's worshipped besides Allah. Then he, his, his, his wealth and his life, his blood will become sacred. Like Allah actually tells us to do kufr. And the Prophet told us to do kufr of taghut. What's even shocking is that Allah told you to do kufr of the false gods before you believe in Allah. You have to nullify and falsify the falsehood before you can affirm the good. If I have a cup and it's covered with filth, I can't pour nice, you know, fresh water in there until I purify it first. Do you see? So, so hey. like, coming into the deen requires you to, to understand, hey, this is right and this is wrong and I'm not going to accept the wrong. I can't. I mean, for goodness sake, the Quran, one of its names is Al-Furqan. Because what does it do? It separates and it distinguishes between right and wrong. So, no. it's shocking that people have this mentality. Sheikh, I want to actually address... Uh, there was a few refutations that you've done from some, some individuals who is, I will maybe mention because they kind of have died out as time's gone by and some of them have tried to make a comeback on things like TikTok because they're trying to make, trying to be fresh with the youngsters and the youth and whatnot. But I won't really mm. mention them because they kind of are not relevant. But what I would like to talk about is the one about Nu'man Nikhan. The reason I want to talk about the one about Nu'man Nikhan and Bayan Institute is because I think the issue of Nu'man Nikhan exposes a big hypocrisy amongst some of these, uh, you know, du'at, some of these du'at, and also just the Muslim community in general. Let me explain what I mean. Um, a few years ago, there was this issue with Nu'man Nikhan and, you know, his own personal affairs, which I don't want to talk about in any way, shape, or form. And I don't think it's even fair for us to address those issues because any of the claims and things that they brought up against him would not even stand in the court of law. In Islamic court of no. law So that stuff there You know That's it, We don't even give it any weight As far as I'm concerned Sahih. He's innocent And he's free of all those claims Because unless a person Sahih. brings A proof You know The, the burden no. of proof Is upon the one making the claim and, and the proof that they Won't stand in Islamic court So as far as we're concerned He's absolutely innocent And free from that But But The people Played judge, jury and executioner 
and they dropped him. Mm. Do you see? They dropped him. Yeah. Not only that, these big du'at, Yasser Qadi and these Al-Maghri people and Umar Suleiman, they all came out and what did they do? They refuted him publicly. They dropped him publicly. They freed themselves from him. Because of what? Number one, a personal issue. If, if at most you could say a personal deficiency, and even then at most, well, it would be a sin. A major sin at most you could say. But... What you what you commanded to to conceal, by the way, Islamically? Yeah, you're after you, that. By the way, you're not supposed to come out and refute publicly. Interesting. Nah, nah. You've highlighted nah. That. Yeah. So, like, Kushak, I'll be honest with you. If if I was to come out and mention the things that I know about some people in their private affairs, Wallahi, I would be like a tabloid newspaper. Like my channel would be <laughs> popping. Like we, but but and and if if it was about chasing clout and just getting views and being controversial, then Inna Lillahi wa Inna Ilaihi Rajiun. I mean. I have an email inbox called Nasiha Session where people email me about their private affairs and you'll be shocked to see some of the things that I see about some of the people that are even out there. You know what I'm saying? Publicly. Mm. But we, we keep that stuff, what? You know, hidden. Because, you know, Sorry. everyone has shortcomings and deficiencies behind closed doors. <coughs> so our issue with Manli Khan was not his per personal life. Do you see? That's not what our, what our issue was. Our issue was with regards to what he was doing with regards to the Quran, like his, he was interpreting the Quran in a way which was dangerous. He wasn't interpreting the Quran based on the Sunnah of the Prophet. Ali now, Ali interestingly, Allah Azza wa Jal, you know, he mentioned that, you know, Muhammad, we sent down the Quran upon you. Why? So that you, Muhammad, can explain to the people. Clarify what was sent to them. It's interesting because you cannot explain the Quran without hadith. And then he would tell you, I'm not a person who knows hadith. I just, you know, I do this. And I'm going to let you talk more about that in a second. But what I wanted to just kind of identify straight away is that for people, it was more important his personal kind of life and refuting him and dropping him on that. But what he was doing with regards to the book of Allah, they didn't see that to be quite important. They didn't see that to hold weight When he was saying things that were sometimes I'm not saying it's Ash'ari But sometimes he was saying things that were like borderline Ash'ari beliefs You know, maybe because He used to read a lot of Mu'tazili Tafasir And then he used to project that onto the people And he would say it I, I took this from the Mu'tazili Tafasir Tafasir that Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Hajar would say Don't read this Tafsir It's dangerous Because no. you know, it, it, the guy creeps his beliefs in So, Sheikh, why do you think that was? Why do you think that the people They defended him they still worked with him, they supported him, they gave him victory, even though he was he was he was coming with things that were that were deviations in terms of the foundations of the religion. But when it came to his personal life, something that were commanded to conceal, something that they didn't have proof for in Islamic court, something that was just between him and Allah ultimately, they said, Hey, we're gonna bring that out to the public. Sheikh, why? Why why was this hypocrisy amongst these du'at? Why does why this hypocrisy amongst the the, the Muslim community? Zakallah khair. I, I just want to clarify that you, I mean, you're saying the term Sheikh uh, uh, casually, like I use it casually. So for anybody out there, uh, no, he doesn't think I'm a Sheikh and I don't think I'm a Sheikh either. So slow your <laughs> roll in case you're getting any ideas. But in, in here in Saudi, when we see a cat down, you say a Sheikh, Wakhri. And even the cat uh, gets the title of a Sheikh <laughs> the cat is well, in the it. ultimate sense. Yes. Like you're also sheikh. Uh, but it's because you're also older, Masha. People, I think people need to, they need to understand, Mashallah. You know, Masha, you're, you're, you're older than us, Allah Barik. So I have to give you yeah, that respect. Yeah, I'm uh, 41 years old. I don't know if I'm going to uh, qualify to be a sheikh from an age perspective, but but regardless, uh, we'll use it casually, inshallah, like we're using it and everybody should understand our intentions. To answer your question, Habibi, look, the reason why is because uh, when when you're, yani, uh, إذا, إذا ضللت عن السبيل, يعني, ما في إشكال في, في لون الضلال. Once you're, once you're off the path, Whichever color, whichever uh, variation, whichever path you wind up selecting uh, from the various paths of misguidance that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu clearly explained to the Ummah when he drew the line in the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud and told them, هَذَا صِرَاتُ اللَّهِ مُسْتَقِيمًا and this is the straight, line of, uh, straight path of Allah. Then, uh, thumma, uh, then he drew lines on the side. He said, هَذِهِ سُبُلْ These are other paths. And, uh, and at the top uh, of each of these paths is the shaitan calling you on to him. So once you've taken a path away from the Sunnah, your concern is no longer, you don't have that jealousy for the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we can see that clearly in the behavior of those uh, du'at. 
and I'm not, I'm not speaking in their personal behavior as we both agreed this is off the books and off the, the discussion off the table. We're talking about their behavior from a da'wah perspective, from a religious point of view. We see already that the sunnah holds little value and therefore you don't expect him to have an issue with another person upon a different dev deviation as long as everybody is in the same pool getting popular uh, in the process and they're reaching out to the maximum number of followers. Uh, and that's why they wouldn't have an issue if he was saying they will basically they will find it they will fetch an excuse for him for sure but when the matter becomes uh, personal uh, and now it's going to tarnish the image of other du'at because oh, now they're also going to be targeted you see a western da'i then it's western du'at uh, oh, an american be. da'i becomes a fellow american du'at and so because it might affect them in some way and uh, then basically, do you do you keep the allegiance or do you drop them? Of course, you're gonna drop them because your uh, your platform, in their uh, in their opinion, their platform is more important than an individual, mm. which really boils down to the fact that their platform is also more important than the Sunnah, because on the same grounds, when when we come out and say, listen, ya akhi, where this is our objection to some of these things that you're saying or doing, and our objections are not something that my uncle told me last week or something that I pulled out of my pocket. Everything that we say, and Allah is our witness, and, and you people know, are based on what the scholars have taught. Of course, the point of contention is, well, your scholars versus our scholars, that's an, a never-ending debate and a vicious cycle. Nevertheless, it is qualified scholars that we refer to. The people don't want, they, they want to undermine them because those scholars are also calling them to the same sunnah that they don't want to adhere to. Uh, it's understandable. But we bring forth things uh, that are pretty much not available in the English language. We might have an advantage, at least in my case, that I'm an Arab, so I'm able to, to some degree, with my uh, you know uh, inefficient uh, skills. With I'm not a I'm not a flu fluent or I'm not a native speaker, but to some degree, I'm able to convey what the ulama have said in Arabic to the English speaking audience, and that's not in their interests that someone will highlight and bring them out. And so you get attacked and you're called all types of names. And you know, Yasser Qadi, probably the, the prime example of someone who uses the most derogatory, insulting terms to anybody who dares to speak about his, I would say, majesty and his own opinion. We, you can't say anything about him without being called, uh, you know, neophyte and uh, other words that he's, Medieval. you know, people that have been destined to the dustbin of history or can co signed to the dustbin of history and other terms yeah, which are really insulting uh, to someone that's trying to simply clarify that hey you you're, you've you've changed you've gone off the path uh, that you used to call to it's not like you're we're just simply saying you're different now we're not even saying that yani to me it's mind-boggling that the people have a problem with you highlighting to someone that you used to call to what we're calling to now mm. and you've clearly changed and now we're getting the, the criticism and the, you know, the, the hatred for highlighting that you've changed, something that you admit and, you and that we get called I, I think it's important so to it's, mention this point here because some people, will, they, they will hold us to account and they will say, look, change isn't necessarily bad. I mean, look at Imam al-Shafi'i, he has a madhab which is jadid and a madhab which is qadim. He had you know, hey. a, a madhab in Iraq and then you know, he changed some of his opinions and his positions when he came to Egypt. It's important to know that the religion is... Is, is divided into usul and furur. It has foundational elements and then there are sub-branch elements. The sub-branches are issues where a lot of the times there's a difference of opinion based on you know, uh, evidences. One group is looking at the evidence and saying it's weak. One is saying it's it's uh, authentic. One saying it's abrogated. One saying it's an abrogator. One saying it's specific. One saying it's general. One saying strict. One saying unrestricted. And that's you know masail ijtihadia. And that's in sub-branch issues. And that in it, kind of changing your opinion and position in those in those issues is not really an issue. You know, it's 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 not something where you know uh, it's 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 not like a it, it's, it's it's not frowned upon. It's not frowned upon. Let in kafi masa'ili li had. But what is questionable is that a person is changing his foundations. Sahih. Right? Like, like your religion is built upon certain, certain, certain roots. To say no, no, no. This root right here, I, 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 dis I differ. I disagree with it. And that's why you know Hudayfa radiyallahu taala anhu, who was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi companion. Ali you know, he said. Uh, 
be, be aware of a talun. Talun is to change your colors. Talun fi din. Be careful of changing your colors in your religion, changing you know, your, 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 your view, your perspective. He said, from the greatest signs of misguidance is that you used to see something as good and today you see it as evil. He was talking about the Sahih. foundations of religion. So, yes, Al Qadi used to see calling to Tawheed as good, calling to the Sunnah as good. You know, the Asif is Shadeed. I remember one of the first speakers that I ever saw when I was 13 years old was Yasser Qadi on Islam channel before it became un Islamic. <laughs> he used to be okay. quite Islamic. And he used to come on and he had a series. And the first video I ever watched was him was calling to Tawheed. It was refuting shirk and amulets and. I remember I learned it from there. And then I remember even though I wasn't practicing and I didn't know the deen, but I learned these ta'weez, they are they are what? They're, they're shirk. And I had to get rid hey. of them. And I'd see my family, I'd get rid of it. That was, I came into contact with him, calling to tawheed, calling to the nah. sunnah, calling to salafi. And now the man has done a 180, subhanAllah. How, 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 do you, how do you change so much? Like, how do you, how do you change so much? Where is it coming from? Uh, يعني, Allah alam, akhi, is, is one, one uh, we, we, we have to assume good at the end of the day if we were to follow the methodology of the conspiracy theorists then uh, we could we could accuse or assume all types of nasty stuff uh, you know from from someone being an agent <coughs> to someone being there يعني, wallah, it's an it's a never-ending uh, uh, discussion uh, we don't want to go there. I, I don't think it's healthy because we, it's, it's always going to be a guess game until one day something is exposed. Yani something beyond us yeah. gets exposed that is flat out undeniable that, okay, this was why the change happened. Otherwise, it's, it could be the, the, the usual factors. If someone is not an agent for some, some entity, some organization, then it is basically, أخي, it's, it's fame. Fame is, is a double-edged sword. Fame is, is a, يعني, it will break the, the, break the backs of men. Mm. And, um, and unfortunately, as, as in the Nu'man Ali Khan case, when I made the video, in my introduction to the lecture, in order to explain to the people that we, we play a factor, the, the Muslims, the followers, are a factor in the issues that those du'at suffer from. Because they, they hold them in such a high pedestal, such a high platform that they make the person think that how can I possibly be wrong with all these people telling me, Shaykh, Jazakallah khairan, Barakallah feek, Shaykh, without you, my life is nothing. Shaykh, I was going to commit suicide until I saw your video and now I'm living the best life. Shaykh, you are more than my mother and father. Shaykh, Shaykh, Shaykh. With, with all that going into someone's head, Akhi, uh, and then they feel, of course, the shaitan will beautify, as, as the ulama says, the shaitan will beautify for them uh, this. And then they start thinking, okay, look, if, if I'm affecting X amount of people positively, if I, can, if I can influence even more, then what do I have to do? Then you have to start watering things down. Because as long as you're, you're stern and rigid, and as long as you adhere to principles, you're going to be following the way of the prophets and the prophets were hated again by the disbelievers. So we can be clear. There's always a group of believers with sound iman and sound heart who will, who will appreciate, who will love the person who tells it to them as it is, who's straightforward, no sugar coating, no playing around, no beating around the bush. Look, this is what it is. If you're able to adhere, Congratulations, Barakallah Feek. If you're not, then we all have a shortcoming. I, as a speaker, have a shortcoming. You, as a listener, have a shortcoming. We make dua that Allah rectifies our condition. Mm -hmm. That approach, which is the most straightforward approach, is appreciated by a minority. Just like the prophets were followed by a minority. Mm -hmm. The majority of people always went against the truth. Whether in totality, by not accepting the religion altogether, or by accepting aspects of it and then rejecting others that conflicted with their preferences, their desires, or mm -hmm. as Allah said, ilahu hawah. Have you seen the one who has taken his, his, uh, himself as his own God, mm -hmm. his own ideology, his own thinking, his own uh, way of approaching things? Yeah. And that is the disease that the Muslims suffer from today. And because of that, they have such a hard time digesting someone... Uh, addressing these issues, even though the scholars say this is among the most honorable acts of worship. Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, was asked, uh, a, rajul yasumu yusalli, 
a person will fast and pray and do all types of ibadat or he will, he will uh, uh, refute and criticize the people of innovation. Which one is better? He said, as for the first one, he's benefiting himself. Whereas the second one, he's benef it's nafa' muta'addi. It's the type of benefit that exceeds the person to the fellow Muslims. Mm. And that is superior. This is the greatest Sahih. type of, of uh, act of worship. So Sahih. we do this seeking actually ajr from Allah. Sahih. That we will stand on Yawm Al-Qiyamah carrying a barrier or a flag that we made an effort with, with admitting our shortcomings, with admitting that we don't always get it right. Just like everybody doesn't always get it right, but we made some effort to bring forth to the people, the, the teachers of the Prophet ﷺ, and to make sure that they're aware of the opposite. Just like Hudayfa you mentioned, he used to ask Prophet ﷺ an uh, because he needed to know how to avoid it. Yes. And today the Muslims are gullible. Most of us are so gullible, they believe, and they see a video with a little animation, and they forward it to you know, the, all of their contacts. And in this video, there could be 20, 25 mistakes that the basic student of knowledge can, can identify. Sahih. The average Muslim does not think, or they post things, uh, some you know, naked woman to deliver a message about racism. From the, from the basics of the deen, you can deliver the message of racism that you want, but you cannot use evil means. Uh, and you expect everybody on Facebook to lower their gaze as soon as they, you see their post. When you try to advise them, Afrisha, they get who, back who to you. Who is this? Who did that? Uh, oh, everybody. Uh, at least every, a lot of the people on my Facebook page, which I wind up unfriending. You get a Facebook uh, uh, <laughs> request. You, you try to be nice. I re accept. Five minutes later, I see the first post. I unfriend. And so I'm in the business <laughs> of accepting and, and unfriending all the time. But yeah, and this is the methodology. And that's to me, this is it's a, it's a sign of our state and that explains why mm. a lot of heat, we get a lot of heat, which, which I don't mind, mm. uh, which we don't mind because at the end of the day, we believe that we're doing this uh, for the right reasons and we've seen the fruits. Uh, we've seen the fruits. While there are many people that, you know, they like get upset. Why did you speak about my favorite sheikh? There are many people who say, Akhi, khair. Wallahi, I did not know. And I started paying attention mm -hmm. after you made these, uh, after you've highlighted these issues. And now I've, I've started listening to fulan and fulan instead of fulan and fulan. And you can see the transformation of that no. person's religious commitment. No. You can see that they take matters more seriously. No. That, you know, the, the halal and the haram matter to them. Mm -hmm. Before it was all a party. I mean, mm -hmm. the way I see the da'wah in the West for the most part, if it's not upon the way of Salafiyyah, it's just a, it's a club. Mm -hmm. It's a club and everybody's just partying and it's, you know, a mingling men and women. And I, of course, I'm just uh, giving you an, an imagery and I don't mean it specifically or, or uh, in literal sense, but there's alcohol being passed around, uh, people just getting high, everybody's having a blast. And, and you're like coming in as the police, uh, the haram police, and you say, hey, hey, yeah, Sheikh, what are you doing over there? And it's like, you're the one who's spoiling everybody's party. But Sheikh, it's not far. Like now, these Sheikhs and these Muftis, they take pictures with girls. They take selfies with girls. So it's 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 not it's not it's not long until, I mean, look, ten years ago, we'd never imagined that a a, a teacher, a Sheikh, an Ustad, or a Mufti, I use these terms loosely, would just you know be standing right next to a woman taking a picture. And it's not going to be long until he's maybe putting his arm around her. Allah knows. Like the times are getting really, really bad. Sheikh, I, I wanted no. to bring this back to the issue of Yasqad. You mentioned a few points that I want to come back to in a second. For example, the issue of um, it being a very small amount of people that accept uh, you know, the Sunnah and whatnot. There's a few very important points. That, that, but I just want to close the issue of Yasqadi. So you mentioned that you know the issue of fame, uh, Shuhra, and I believe that that definitely it plays a role with regards to um, with regards to Yasir Qadi and his deviation and his changing. Um, but I believe there's a few layers to this, which I think will be healthy to unpack. I think another thing that really kind of affected him was, and why he changed, was that when he went to Yale, he actually got thrown shubuhat, he got thrown doubts from the kuffar that he himself was not able to answer. And I think, you know, having been a student from the University of Medina, uh, having done a master's there, and, you know, you can kind of see that he's quite proud of his academic achievements. He must have seen himself to be quite uh, able to deal with these shubuhat. And when he was faced up against these shubuhat, uh, not having the answers, I think his maybe the, sh the shubha settled in him. And perhaps he didn't have the strength and personality to combat combat them, or the humility to be able to ask someone who doesn't, who knows. Allah knows best. I don't know what it was, but the shubha settled in him. 
But what's shocking is that these doubts that settled in his heart, okay, my brother, if you didn't, so, so, so what it seems that he must have done is that he must have tried to find a way to answer them. Do you see? And he didn't find the answer in himself. I don't know why he didn't go out and ask scholars because these issues have been refuted in a very candid, clear-cut and more than satisfactory way from the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the methodology of the Salaf. For example, the issue of the Qira'at in the Qur'an. Like, there are books that have been written by scholars who have an expertise in Qira'at where they've clarified these issues. They've all these shubuhat about tawatur and this, that, right? they've gone through it. They've, they've already broken it down. I don't know why he didn't go and, hey, Sheikh, <laughs> you know, I, didn't, I don't know the answer to this question. Can you break it down for me? But he decided to basically, you know, reinvent the wheel and try to find another way to answer it and try to find, you know, people who he looked at as authorities in the religion who had a fringe view here and there and just kind of bring all their views together and try to kind of, Combat hey. these doubts that came his way So whatever it was I just want to take a lesson from here For our brothers and sisters And just highlight the importance of doubts And staying away from them Like if Yasir yeah. Qadi is a man Who studies in the University of Medina And he went to an institution In which he's up against people Who are trying to destroy Islam every day And they're hurling doubts about Islam If he can be affected Then so can me and you and what's greater as an example to use is the example of Imam Abdul Razak al-Sanani, who is one of the teachers of Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed is Imam Ahl Sunnati wal Jama'ah. He's one yeah. of his teachers. And he has a musannaf. He's got a great book in which he brings athar of the Salaf and the Sahaba and many narrations. He's an Imam of the Sunnah. But in his later years, he got affected by some of the beliefs of the Shia. He didn't become a Shi'i, but he had some tashayyur entered inside of him. And when he was yeah. asked, Sheikh, like you know, you're an imam of the Sunnah and your teachers are all teachers of the Sunnah and your students are all men of the Sunnah. Like, how did some of the Shia beliefs enter in you? He said, There was an imam from the Shia. I was amazed by his manners. I would go and I would listen to him. And some of the tashayu entered inside of me. So, this is hey, Imam uh, Abdul Razak, the teacher of Imam Ahmed, who found that he wasn't able to shield himself off. From the doubts of Ahlul Bid'ah and, and, and me and you think that we can That's why we were given extreme instruction Not extreme, sorry But very strict instruction by the Prophet Iyakum wa muhdathat al-umur Stay away Be aware of the newly invented matters Don't go near Don't listen Don't lend an ear Allah said to the Prophet Wasallam, You know, if you lean Towards them If you lean towards them The punishment will touch you Allah's punishment will touch you If you lean towards them Muhammad So forget leaning You're going to sit with them The Prophet Ali said Allah has cursed me upon the one who Shelters an innovator Forget sheltering You go and study with him You go listen to his videos You enjoy it you work with him. You support Allah's curse is descending upon this person. You know why? It's not that the religion doesn't have the answers. Wallahi, it does. From the beginning yeah. to the end, the religion is preserved and protected. Beginning to the end, you find Ibn Taymiyyah has refuted the atheists before they before you knew there was a thing called new atheism. You see, yeah. he's already ripped it to shreds. He's already yeah. ripped it to shreds. It's there, but you and I maybe don't have the tools. To be able to access it right now Or we maybe haven't come across the answer So our hearts are weak Our hearts are weak Wallahi You know So to lend a minute Wallahi I came across a narration From Fudayl ibn Iyad Rahimahullah ta'ala And for not even Fudayl ibn Iyad One of the imma Of the Salaf And they said It's not even permissible And they transmit from the Salaf It's not even permissible To look At Ahl bidah The narration says that Looking at Ahl bidah Will inherit inside of your heart deviation And well that's true Like the same If I'm going to look at a woman And my iman will drop And that's just desires That's shahwa That's just That's just major sins You think when I look at a man of bidah My iman will not going to drop When he's got something worse than shahwa He's got shubuhat You know look at him yeah. He's just looking at him His beard is shaven But he's standing on the mimbar He's called Like that is that this, that's, just, that's just wrong You know he's standing on the mimbar yeah. He's in alhamdulillah 
but his beard is shaven. You know, his trousers mm. below his ankles. But like this guy got shubu hat, just looking at a shiri, looking at a shiri. Well, like, it makes it makes the heart dark. It makes it dark. Looking yes. at a Sufi man, you know, like it just makes the heart dark. So the seraph wouldn't even look at them. They would say, "Don't look at them." If I can't look at a woman because it's going to lead me to a major sin. How can I think it's okay for me to look at a man of innovation what will lead me to innovation perhaps? And then what? People are not looking. They say they're listening and they're studying and they're following and they're, they're paying money. That's the great the greatest part of this is yeah. that uh, if you can't understand uh, the issue of the huruf and the qiraat, you just sign up for the class. The hundred students who joined and had a blast from the past and learned all these uh, secretive matters that we cannot tell the average Muslim about. If you pay money and you enroll with the professor, then you'll get, uh, you know, easy access. And it's to being taught by knowledge. what? Orientalist kuffar. Yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah. His syllabus is shocking. Because the syllabus, what he's teaching them. He's not teaching them, you know, uh, you know, classical texts from scholars who are experts in qiraat. You know, Ibn Mujahid and Imam al shatibi and Imam Al-Jazari. Abu Amr, Adani, he's not teaching them these classical scholars who were experts in Qur'at. They got it wrong. They got it yeah, wrong. Yeah. But, you know, the Orientalist Jeffrey, <laughs> or whatever his name is, he happened to, he happened to expose <laughs> the issue of Qur'at. And it is. opened a can of worms for, for the people. I mean, I know you, uh, uh, Mansoor, I know you're familiar with, with all the, uh, I mean, look, Ahmad Didat, Rahimahullah, uh, you know, he 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 put he put out some some major effort. Uh, we know he had. I I know he has a few issues in his aqidah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to forgive him, forgive Ameen. us. Allah but in terms Ameen. of da'wah, in in terms of da'wah, uh, he single handedly slaughtered Christianity for decades, and and nobody could even come could even win a single a, a round in a battle, let alone a battle, let alone a debate, let alone uh, more than that. And all of the construction that he built, which would really, if you think about it today, the Muslims in the da'wah to Christians, Benefited. we stand on a pretty mighty platform of, 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 you know, of confidence and strength uh, and, and what we have. And Wallahi. that has been destroyed Wallahi. by this one individual who couldn't, Articulate uh, uh, an answer that that was the, the any basic even uh, even even Maulana Juju Bajuju in the uh, mountain of Zalalulu would have been able to answer this if somebody told them about the Quran and preservation will tell you Akhi, inna nahnu dhikra wa inna Zakallah khair, yalla, go play with your toys or something I don't have time for you I uh, just sit there and say Wallahi in this uh, however if you let me because I am uh, my masters with the sheikh and I graduated but the, yani, I don't understand and now the Christians have made videos uh, tens hundreds of videos I'm constantly getting comments on my channel on videos that are related or even not related to the topic now everybody has the, the confidence to come and attack and say yeah you guys got issues like we got issues and so on and so forth that is devastating, man, and that is such a disservice to the da'wah and disservice to Islam. And I am heartbroken that people uh, are more jealous for the honor of, of this brother uh, than the religion itself. That they would, they would still prefer to defend him or anybody else for this matter more so than they would like to defend the sunnah of Allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam more so than the revelation itself the book of Allah is being questioned man and that's something un unheard of if uh, you really think about it at that at that level it's and, and, and especially and, in modern days and you know what and me, people Shaykh, yes is, I find, is that he you know what he said he said i have a workable theory to explain the preservation of the quran like i think to myself well, like, what are you talking about my bro like this is a this is a revelation. Allah said, "I will preserve it." Allah said, "I will take it upon myself to preserve the dhikr, the Quran and the Sunnah." And you're telling me that you got a workable theory, <laughs> like, yeah. other, like as as in. We, we're not even sh like he's, he's like I'm experimenting I'm trying to connect the dots and right. I've got a work I've got a workable theory to explain you know 
what a lot like, which might or might not work which might obviously. or might not work and and that's another right. problem that and by the way just to mention because some people might be watching this and might think well what are the answers Ustad Abdul Rahman done a detailed series on his YouTube yes. channel it's called the Allah Prasad Khaira. book where he actually went nah. through these shubuhat of the orientalists and he stripped them from the ground and he used Classical resources. So if anyone wants to, I'll put the link inshallah below for that for that playlist so they can check it out. But you know they have this concept, Sheikh, of aqidah will evolve and it evolves and our creed evolves and the religion evolves and we have to like I look, I understand that there are certain you know issues that are contemporary issues. The Quran and Sunnah might not have mentioned it specifically. So you look at the principles within the Quran and Sunnah and you apply them. For example, there's no ayah from the Quran that's gonna tell you cocaine. Is haram So how right. did the scholars work it out They said well there's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said haram. Every intoxicant is haram And okay cocaine is an intoxicant Heroin is an intoxicant These are all intoxicants So then they would also be haram We don't need Allah to mention it specifically But there are principles There are principles But these guys They're not talking about those kind of contemporary issues They're talking about foundational fundamental things Like we have to work out a theory how the Quran was preserved, like <laughs> in order to please, in order to basically uh, address people that I've always said in in my experience in Dawah. I don't know; it's been more than fifteen years. Uh, I've I've spoken to every type of deviant Allah created, and <laughs> I've come to the realization that when you have a person that has a problem with Allah Himself then by default, you should expect this person to have a problem with any of Allah's legislation. Yeah. If, if he has a hard time comprehending that he was created to worship his creator, which was in his natural disposition, then instantaneously he will also develop a problem and an objection to any ruling that Allah Azza wa has revealed. And so that's why when, when I give da'wah and when we give da'wah, this is always in, in the back of my mind. When you have the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam disbelieve in him and die upon kufr, not one, but two. When you have people that were present at the time of Musa or the time of Isa or the time of Ibrahim or uh, Lut Alayhi Salam or Nuh and they rejected a, a Rasul from Allah who performed miracles, ya akhi, they ayat, saw the sea signs, split. I don't want to say, signs from Allah, something that your mind cannot even wrap your head around, you can't deny, you can't, they, they managed to disbelieve. And what was the numbers? If you follow the majority of people on earth, they will misguide you from the path of Allah. The majority of people, Disbelief in the prophets and يعني, the prophet will come in yawm al-qiyamah wa ma'ahu rajul wa yati al-nabi wa laysa ma'ahu ahad. A prophet will come with zero followers. A prophet Allah selected from among mankind. Therefore, therefore, just bear in mind that if I am going now to use this methodology of modifying Islam and having to come up with workable theories to satisfy individuals that will never be satisfied. Mark the words. They will never be satisfied until you abandon Islam. Never, ever will the Jews and the Christians be pleased with you until you until you follow their complete way of life. And that would apply obviously to the and Jews. Sheikh, that's Christian vital there what you just said. Because that's exactly what he's trying to do in the academic realm. He's trying to appease the kuffar. He's trying to appease them. And that's clear because one of the reasons why I feel like he's fallen into what he's fallen into and he's going to these workable theories is because they they would a lot of confidence will say to you, this is our epistemology, meaning this is our yardstick to measure truth. This is how we yeah. measure what is right and what is wrong. So their their yardstick, for example, is not something like Senate. Isnad. Isnad is one of the most proficient, so chain of narration is one of the most proficient and one of the most absolutely miraculous ways, if more than miraculous ways, if you get it right, to, maybe miraculous is the wrong term because it can be found, in other, the, the point is, yeah. it's, it's such a robust way of verifying something to be true, yeah. but they don't accept it. For whatever reason. Exactly. And the reason yeah. why they don't accept it is not because 
it's not true, but because we live in a very naturalistic, scientific, uh, inductive world where everything is based on what you can see, what you can observe, manuscripts that have to be carbon dated, this, that, blah, 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 blah. So everything has to be verified based on the senses. Do you see where I'm coming from? But you see, we have. But some... Amran, yeah. Sorry, I want to. But that is actually ancient. Because I, 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 you can continue, but I want to add this point. Barakallahi. Even this is this is modern day uh, uh, justification. Back in the day, what did they say to the Prophet? They said, "We will not believe in you until you bring the Quran to us physically. Uh -huh. Until to, to khrij, until you bring a yambur. We want to see a river flow. Until you have castles. It's actually the same thing. They also wanted to see things. Yeah. Uh, the, you, you, yani they want to see Allah jahra. They want to see Allah with their own eyes. Their own they eyes. want to see certain. They want to condition and stipulate what the yardstick of their belief was always stipulated by them, <coughs> because." They don't want to believe. Mm. The, the, the bottom line is they, there was never an issue in Allah's wisdom. What he gave the Prophet uh, w was sufficient for the one who wants to believe to believe. Always Allah gave humans exactly what is sufficient for them to believe. And yet uh, humans wanted to add more. Mm. And Allah Azza wa Jal wasn't going to obviously uh, because that defies the objective of, of being tested in this world. Allah gave him the yardstick and anything other than that is just simply rejected. So back then with the previous prophets, they wanted something tailored for them. And today they want something tailored for them. So how did the prophets behave? The prophets, did they say, okay, well, let me, let me go negotiate with, with my Lord about your request. Or did they simply do what Allah Azza wa Jal told them and they kept it as is? Yeah. They kept it as is. And today we representatives of the Anbiya because the people given da'wah are the people that are trying to represent the, the message of the prophets on earth. We have, to, we have the same ultimatum. Mm. Either I'm going to say this is what it is. If you don't believe it, if it's not sufficient for you, you have a problem. I don't got no problem. Sahih. I've never had a problem. I will never have a problem. This is the deen of Allah. If you have a hard time understanding it, you can object to your creator on Yawm Al-Qiyamah and Allah knows what's in your heart. But for me to come now and try to play a big game of philosophy and going into all these you know, mountains and hills and valleys trying to make sense to you when you don't want it to make sense because you want to reject to begin with then the, the, you, this is your issue yeah and this is this should be our stance i'm sorry I no, no, absolutely. You, but I, and, hey. and just to re-echo your point like to show you how deficient their mentality of wanting to see things to be true like for example if i take my phone and i place it now inside my pocket you can no longer well you can still see it but if i put it underneath the table you can't see it but do you know that my phone is Underneath the table But you can't see it yeah. You're not now you, you, You're now inferring Based on something that goes A bit above and beyond Your Your sensory experience Do you see where I'm coming from? So It's a very Sahih. limited kind of Methodology And even they themselves Are not consistent with it Because they have to In their day to day lives Resort towards Something that supersedes uh, Just The ability to be able to see So coming back to this point here of the issue of uh, Isnad and Senad. Um, yeah. They call it testimony. They call it testimony. That's what they call it. You know, uh, chain of narration. They don't, they, they, like, they, they, they call it testimony. I don't want to go too complicated for people and kind of make them switch off. The point I'm making is that for them, it's not a proof. Even though their forefathers, like David Hume, who was one of the early atheists that kind of paved the way for, you know, European atheism. Even he said, you know, for example, if we had, if we had, if we had te proof by a testimony to show you that there was darkness in the in the earth for seven days straight, the sun didn't come up. We would be forced to believe it, even though we couldn't see it with our own eyes. So even their own academics, they understand this to be something quite robust. But I'm saying Nayas Saqadi is in a position where all of his, his ac academic friends are telling you, look, we don't take testimony, we don't take chain of narration to be a proof. So he has to now kind of weasel his way around other ways and avenues to try and. Uh, validate the, uh, the preservation of the Quran But the issue is As we've said As you said so eloquently MashaAllah They don't They don't want to believe In the first place They're only jumping to other things Because they know this is true They know this yeah. method It supersedes Their Whatever it is that they're trying to present But what they've done is They've tried to shut the door On the issue of Isnad And Tawatur And whatnot, And open up something else And what Yasir Qazi is doing He's trying to jump into their ring 
But you have your and own he could, if, he, if he wants to, if he wants to, let's just say that he wants to do that. So do so in your own realm and keep the, the average Muslims out of the loop. That's just yeah. really what it is. If you want to uh, enter this battle with them uh, on their own terms, uh, using their own principles, uh, knock yourself out. It's a, it's a very tiring process. But <coughs> why, why allow the average Muslim to be exposed to this uh, heretical, uh, nonsensical uh, statement or, or standpoint or belief uh, that, that they haven't been exposed to in the past? I think the average one of us in his entire life, I'm 40 uh, plus years old, I've never come across yani, uh, a shubuha of this magnitude. Mm. Uh, you, 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 if, I don't think most most people, most Muslims have gone through their lives. They've heard, you know, women, uh, men marrying more than one wife, you know, the hijab of the Muslim woman. Yeah, you've come across, you know, ordinary shubuhat. But the Quran has always been like away from this whole discussion. Uh, I'm sure there were people speaking about it, but it's within very small circles of, of academics in their own world. And it's not out there for the rest of the world. No one even dared to bring it out to the rest of the world. And sure enough, it was it was brought out uh, to the rest of the world and and unapologetically unapologetically it's just right there uh, in a in a, you know that video he made uh, with the, the podcast and just just like that just like that uh, with without any reservation and the video wasn't even edited or removed or fixed uh, nor a proper clarification was made it was just like here deal with it now and then i'm just gonna go on and go about my business doing what oh, he did doing he put up a little week. facebook post <laughs> i saw i saw but what is that gonna do Habib? Well, like, what, is what is that, is that gonna, gonna do, do? what is that gonna yeah, do yeah what is it gonna do did yeah. it get the same uh, uh, reach no nope. how many people have seen it no nope. and how, the people that watch the video are not like the people that are going to read a Facebook post. People may not even be following him on Facebook, following him on Facebook. But and the they Facebook did post didn't actually the clarify. It just said, you know, it didn't really clarify anything. Is, is anyone? Oh, I know. I read. I read. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a very sad uh, attempt to to mend uh, the damages that were made, and uh, they they seem to be irreversible, at least uh, by him. Alhamdulillah, other people came to the scene, like Sheikh Abdurrahman Hassan, may Allah protect him and preserve him, our Sheikh. And he, he, he put out some, something uh, علمي, uh, knowledge-based, uh, academic, uh, well-researched, and, and by someone who's qualified to address the matter. And, you know, how many people watched that? Versus how many people watched the actual video? As usual, we go back to the same thing, because, you know, people tend to prefer uh, popular, mainstream, can, you know, uh, speakers. And, and they have issues with those who are more uh, strict, I would say, for a good reason. And uh, that's, that's just the state of the ummah. And therefore, nothing is surprising as to why Islam began strange and it will go back to becoming strange. And there will come a time when the one holding on to his religion is like a person holding on to a burning coal. And all of the things Prophet ﷺ said about, you know, and kathira, whoever lives after me will see a lot of difference. All of these hadith and all of these warnings that were given by the Prophet ﷺ, by the Sahaba, by the early generations, we see them uh, in this day and time. So it's upon you, O Muslim, to make that selection. Do you want to follow the dubious uh, uh, characters that are, are basically taking you on a roller coaster? One day you go up, the next day you go down. Or do you want to go with someone that is going straight with mistakes, with errors, but at least, at least their overall uh, methodology, their overall aqidah is clear like the sun. There's nothing, we don't hide. We don't tell you, Allah, you know, it's right there. We say it, it as it, it is. It's not like one day they believe one thing and the next week they believe something so fundamental. Like, for example, you know Yasser Qadi wrote a kitab in Ulum al-Quran way, way back in the day. And, you nah. know, he talks about the preservation of the Quran there and then like to just like flip it. <laughs> it's like, it's like, you know, even, even if, even if you were going to say you grew up, you realize one or two, like one, two things, major things you got wrong, but like him, the concept of bid'ah, I totally misunderstood it. <laughs> the concept of refutation, I totally misunderstood it. The co concept of manhajiya, I totally misunderstood it. The preservation of the Quran, I totally misunderstood it. The concept of free mixing, I totally misunderstood it. I totally Everything. misunderstood it. The aqidah. Yes. Aqidah used to be uh, athari. Now, what, what do you prefer? You're at a supermarket, you have an aisle for athari, an aisle for ash'ari, an aisle for, uh, you know, maturidi. So go ahead, Habibi, select whichever one you want to select. Go ahead, study it. It's all good. It's all I, mainstream. I, 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 and I shall, yeah, sh 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 sh
You know how you said I'm that there was the, the type of shubuhat that we used to see? Were kind of like, you know, this, that, several wives, polygamy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And Quran, he's got a shubha that he is planning to bring out, which is even more shocking. And I planning to bring out, what does that mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I just done a podcast with uh, Sheikh Muhammad Tim Humble on this issue. Because of uh -huh. you know, he's met with him personally, he had a private conversation with him, and um, that podcast may come out before this one or after. So whatever it does, people watching they can refer back to it. But uh, Sheikh, his shubha is on La ilaha illallah. La, ya Captain. La, yeah. la. Turn off this thing. Shut down, ya Shut yeah. down. Go home. Go sleep. La, yeah, yeah. la, la. But what, what his shubha is that we've misunderstood we've misunderstood La ilaha illallah for fourteen hundred years. <laughs> yeah. Wallah. Yeah, wallah, Sheikh. لا يا أخي والله this is no that's borderline زندقة والله it's borderline heresy now yeah the زندقة case started earlier but that's that's yeah yikes that's is yikes or yikes or whichever one it is I'm that's like that I'm cringing you see you see recently he came out on Sheikh Mohammed ibn Abdul Wahab and he had that podcast yes he attacked Mohammed Abdul Wahab yes people need to realize his issue he's not attacking Mohammed ibn Abdul Wahab because of Mohammed ibn Abdul Wahab what he wants to do is he's building the people towards the shubha on Tawheed al-Ibadah, Tawheed al nah. He's trying to basically say, if a person worships a grave, it's not shirk. In and within itself. Okay. If a man, if a man is going to prostrate towards an idol, in and within itself is not shirk. And the reason why I can say that so boldly is because he actually had a conference uh, you know, Sheikh, some people are going to think it's conspiracy, but you know what it is? The thing is, a lot of people know this stuff. What I'm saying right now, a lot of your friendly neighborhood Dawa guys know this stuff, but a lot of them are too scared to bring it out, maybe. Or maybe they're yeah, being a bit course. too, maybe they're being a bit tactical. Allah knows best. But this is, in our circles, this is quite common. You know, I know, no, Masha, like, no. this, I'm just presenting to you this to you first time, but I'm sure you've come across these things before. It's not like, it's like you know, we hear about what they're planning and they're plotting in the scheme before. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because I want to preempt him. Like, even though when he came up with the issue of the Quran, we preempted him. That's that because I, I saw a lot of people, they mentioned it and they said, you know, uh, had, oh, yeah, Prophet Imam already told us he was going to say about this about the Quran. And it's kind of like you brush it under no. the carpet. And Ustad Abdul Rahman, I remember he prepared the refutation for four years. He was preparing that, 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 that research because we had some time. So I will also want to mention this because I want to preempt him. They had a conference in Oxford University on Salafia, uh, which mm. was not allowed to be recorded. But Alhamdulillah, one of okay. our brothers went in and he recorded it. But the brother still didn't send me the recording because Yasir Qadi came to him specifically and he said, you're not allowed to send this to anyone. So Min Babil Amana, he said, I can't share it with you. But... Okay. There was a publication that was released that I managed to get my hands on, alhamdulillah. Okay. And in there he mentioned a summary of what his talk was about. And there is this man, who I won't mention publicly, in Saudi Arabia, who is pushing this shubha on the issue of ibadah. And how ibadah okay. has been totally misunderstood. I think you know who I'm referring to, right? No, I don't. Okay, well, I'll mention it. I, I believe it or not, I don't. Inshallah. But uh, yeah. he he's pushing the shubha with regards to the issue of tawheed and taqseem of tawheed and you know the Quraysh uh, their shirk wasn't the fact that they just worshipped other idols besides Allah their shirk was something else their shirk was in rububiyah or whatever have you or they kind of conflate uluhiyah and rububiyah and if I, and he says very, quite emphatically if a man was to make sajda to an idol if he was to make sujood to an idol it wouldn't be shirk. Unless wow. he believed that that idol had ability to override Allah's power. <laughs> okay, that's. I think I came across a group recently, which I didn't even know they existed until I had a Facebook confrontation. Some Auniyin, is that? The, are we talking ah, about the same? No, exactly. Those are okay. Wow. Yeah, wow. Because yeah, yeah. I, they, yeah, I was like, I was furious. I was like, what are you talking about? Exactly. Like, so, 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 so he, 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 when he came to Oxford University, he present, he basically mentioned this man's research. And oh. said, basically, he argued that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab misunderstood ibadah. Okay. And by the way, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab is not the guy who explained ibadah. <laughs> he just carried on what was already being explained. 
for the last 100 years. years. <laughs> nah, exactly. So, but they want to make it seem like it was Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, where he's clearly quoting Ibn Taym and Ibn Taym and Ibn Qayyim and Ibn, Ibn Taym and Ibn Qayyim are clearly quoting what the Sahaba and the Salaf and you know. Anyway, that's nonsense. The point is that that's what he's working on. And I, 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 because I knew this, and Sheikh Muhammad Tim, when he had that meeting with him privately, when he came to him, he kind of, they talked about similar issues. I started to connect the dots and I said, okay, this is why he's attacking Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and saying he's takfiri. I mean, come on, look, if a man worships an idol, he's a kafir. If a man hey, makes dua to a grave, he's a kafir. But he wants to say Muhammad, and that's, and that's what Muhammad ibn Abdullah was faced with. He was faced with people that are making sujood to graves, doing tawaf around graves, praying to, praying to trees. <laughs> so now, obviously he said, this kufr. Hello. Hello, this is kufr. Yes. So now Yasir yeah. Qadi wants to make it seem like, oh, he's doing takfir on mass, which is a lie. And obviously if you see kufr in front of you, you're going to do takfir of it. You know? No. Otherwise, no. you're going to become a murji. You know, murji, you know what I'm saying? No, so, no. But he's trying to make it seem like, oh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, he was doing takfir of people unjustly. He wasn't unjust. But the way he's going to make, his, make it un, his, present this injustice by saying, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahab, he misunderstood the concept of ibadah and shirk in the first place. So he's misapplying it. So, well, they're going to come with some, some ta'mat, wallahi. The ta'mat al to come. But you know, that is, of course, because once, you, once you enter the issue of, of Tawheed and Shirk, what's left of Islam? Yani, khalas, yani, this Asruddin! Ur uh, al-Islam, yani, one after the other, they're being uh, undone and un untied. Allah uh, Musta'an. Until they come... Uh, akhi, that's, why, that's why you feel... This, see, this is why uh, yani, you, you feel that there is something, some, some background story that we obviously don't know but if you connect the dots and you cannot help but connect the dots, uh, these are not some, some random haphazard uh, uh, events. There, there seems to be a correlation, a connection, and a bigger agenda. I would yeah. just say that it seems that there's a bigger agenda. We have to apply husn al but also you have to apply su al uh, because uh, husn al is in regards to someone who's qualified himself to receive husn al As you know, in Yaqub alayhi salam, when his children uh, uh, had taken Yusuf and they claimed that, you know, the dhib, uh, uh, they came back to him, he said, uh, The second time around, when they actually went to Yusuf uh, in, in Egypt and mm -hmm. he said, you know, your brother stole, and so, you know, the story. Yeah. When they went back to their father and said, we need, we cannot, we, we are unable to bring our brother. He told them again, yeah. even though they were actually innocent the yeah. second time around. And I remember coming across one of the, uh, the scholars of the Salaf saying, this is an example where Su Adhan is actually justifiable because he, they have a history of doing something. So it, it makes sense that you have an evil assumption. And at this point, I mean, how much good assumption are we going to give uh, uh, Yasir Qadi if if they, they, he keeps bringing those things, you know, one after the other, um, and you start thinking that there's a, there's a plan or agenda of some form to clearly confuse the Muslims about the fundamentals of the religion. 100%. And, and, 100%. Yeah, yani, well, because, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, wallahi. Allah al musta'ali. And I don't even want to, we gave him already too much, uh, too much uh, attention, too I would much say. Attention. But, but that's, that's good for the people to know because at the end of the day, uh, Allah Azza wa Jal has always made the truth superior to all the bottle in the world. And, uh, and you, know you, know how the same way, you know the same way how we say that, uh, you know, like Ibn Taymiyyah had already refuted atheism and the shubuhat that the people are coming out with like 700 years ago in the medieval days uh, how the scholars of Qira'at had already mentioned that which would refute the claims of the Orientalists on the preservation of the Quran many many years ago it's all been done even with regards to this issue of ibadah and tawheed the shubha that they're going to come with it's, it's actually shocking because there was an imam as you're aware Abdurrahman ibn Yahya al-Mu'allimi rahmallahu ta'ala the habiul al-Asr who wrote a two-volume book called Raf al-Ishtiba on this very issue. He wrote it like about 70 years before these guys came out. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Like Allah has already, Allah has already placed people in this ummah 
through whom Allah Azza wa Jalla will defend his deen. So it's funny nah. because he's coming out with this stuff and people are going to think Yasser Qadi, the forward moving thinker, he's just copying pasting from this guy in Saudi Arabia. But what they don't know is that there's already, he's already been refuted before he came out. Someone, yeah. Yeah. He to, it's already been refuted. Even, even one, there was one uh, refutation that I got, alhamdulillah, by one uh, sheikh in Pakistan, one Salafi Ahl Hadith scholar there, who already refuted this man and it's not been sent to release. It's not been sent, it's not been put to public, it's not been uh, sent out to be uh, published yet. It's just uh, a first draft. Mm. And I was just thinking, like, mm. wow, like, it's already been refuted. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> but what these people will benefit of is the mainstream, where, as in, you know, they don't have any leg to stand on, but it's just that they met, that, that, that their, their filth reach more people than the clarification reach. And that's literally all it is. But if people were to and die, that's, that's just history repeating itself. That's at the end of the day, we, yani, uh, we, we already know that Allah Azza wa Jal had decreed. Uh, we ask, we're not, by the way, nobody ever claims that we are the safe people and there are two people from Ahlul Jannah having a, a podcast uh, together. Uh, Allah is our witness that we think, at least I think of myself, uh, the worst I can think of someone uh, in terms of my own personal uh, evaluation, my own ibadah, my own what have you. But in terms of the truth that I believe I represent, wallahi, I have, I don't even have a 0.0001% doubt that this is the, uh, the ultimate truth. Because Allah Azza wa Jal made the truth shiny, uh, He made it powerful, self-illuminating, and He made the bottle the exact opposite. So we don't claim to be saved. However, we adhere to the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal, just like He taught this Ummah how to use the bathroom and which hand to use, just as Allah taught this the Ummah the minor, smaller, as minute things of, of how to worship Him, he could not have left the bigger things, the, the matters of dalal and hidayah, the matters of misguidance and guidance, uh, unattended or, or ambiguous or confusing. It's just, it doesn't add up. No, and so the, for the hujjah to be established against mankind, then the truth has to be powerful and it has to be available. It's on the people to either believe in it or on the people to reject it. وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ Say this is the truth from your Lord. Allah gave the people the free will either. You can believe in it, you can disbelieve in it. So when we speak, we're actually trying to, uh, we're, not, we're not thinking that we're better than anyone, but I believe that what I adhere to is better than what this other person is adhering to, by all means. And I'm not, uh, I'm not shy to say this. I don't apologize. I don't have to apologize because if we were to say, Wallahi, I could be right, he could be wrong or I could be wrong, he could be right, then how do, you, how do you identify the truth? Is it through men or is it through the truth itself? And then the men are, are categorized as for the truth. Mm -hmm. It's the other way around. So the truth is self, is a standalone, independent, and we try to attach ourselves to it. Not that uh, individually I am right and individually he is wrong. Mm -hmm. Individually, either you adhere to the truth or you reject it. So in spite of these uh, dilemmas, in spite of these shubuhat and doubts that are being presented by Yasser Qadi or other Western du'at or other institutes or other organizations, because we can go on forever mentioning names, you have to understand that the people upon the truth remain to be a minority. Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah in the ultimate sense remain to be a minority and you, my brother and sister in faith, should not be concerned about popularity, should not be concerned about numbers, should not be concerned about mainstream, you should be concerned about what will save you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah when you stand before Allah, knowing that the truth was presented to you and knowing that in your heart also you have a gauge. Allah Azza wa Jal gave you a gauge to, to know when even when we choose an opinion that is convenient or practical, we know. When we select that which is easier for us to conform to because it is more practical, it is more convenient, we also know. Mm -hmm. Each one of us individually, you know, mm -hmm. so we, we could fool ourselves. But in, in, in reality, Allah Azza wa Jal, يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنُ وَمَا تُخْفِ الصُّدُورُ Allah Azza wa Jal knows the treachery of the eye and what the chest can see. Sahih. So you have to, you know, we have to be real with ourselves and understand that if, if this is the, the platform of da'wah and you have uh, 1,000 people, uh, unfortunately, we could say uh, 20 or 40 or 60 out of the 1,000 will give you the truth unadulterated and, and clear. And then 
Sadly, many others will try to make it more uh, digestible to you. And in the process, there's a lot of compromises. Those compromises will not help you get closer to Allah. They will not help you establish the religion. They will not help the ummah get back on its feet. And all of the problems and, and, and calamities that befall us uh, in different nations and, and, and they materialize in different ways are nothing but a byproduct of our abandonment Sahih. of our religion Sahih. and that truth. Sahih. So we have to just man up basically. You know, Sheikh, I think this would be a nice point to uh, conclude the podcast. This point, Allah Mubarak, that you've mentioned, and you've mentioned it throughout. And I think it's important to really just drive the point home and you've done so mashallah but i think ending it will be good so it settles in people's minds and their hearts is that basically what you're saying is not to measure the truth based on number and you've mentioned some evidences already the ayah from the quran allah said if you follow the majority of people on earth they will misguide you the prophet said that a prophet will come on a day of judgment he saw he saw a met prophet and one prophet had no one with him no one believed we cannot now say that yeah. that prophet he was misguided which you would have to say, if you measure the truth based upon number, you would have to say that Prophet is misguided. If you, if, you, if you say, how can all these people be wrong? Then you have to, by that virtue, say that that Prophet was wrong. Because Sahih. all of his people opposed him. But there's also another beautiful hadith, Wallahi, and I always like to mention this to kind of give solace to people who kind of have this shubha of number. Or who maybe are due to their, them being a minority upon the sunnah are feeling a bit alienated and attacked. And a bit sad. This hadith Allah, is very beautiful. The Prophet mm. sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said, al-ghuraba, glad tidings to the strangers. Sahaba they said, Man al -ghuraba, who are these strangers or messenger of Allah? And there's many different wordings, different narrations authentic to the Prophet. Alayhi wasallam, but there's one very beautiful one which I'd like to mention. Where the Prophet he described them, he said, He said, Unasun Salihuna Qalil. That they are a group of people that are righteous and they are a minority. The Prophet said they are a minority. Okay. And he said, They are amongst a majority of people that are very evil. So then the strangers. Who the Prophet gave glad tidings to will be a minority. They will be a minority that are upon righteousness amidst a group of people who are a majority upon evil. So then we learn that you don't judge the truth based on number. Hatta, we don't even say you judge the truth based on minority, even though the minority. It's more reason to believe that it's correct than it is majority. But the, the, for us, the ibra is not al-adid. We don't yeah. give consideration to the number. It could be that a, in a particular time, the majority are upon guidance and the majority, minority are not. And it could be at a particular time, the minority are upon guidance and the majority are not. And the general rule of thumb is that the minority, generally speaking, are the ones that are upon guidance. No. But it's not about the added because a person might come to you with a very fringe belief that's also deviated. It's not just, mm. oh, he's a minority. He must have some yeah, exactly. credence yes. belief. The point here is that the it's a good clarification, is yeah. based upon text. It's based on delil. It's based upon delil and it's based upon the understanding of that delil. As Imam Ahmed Taala. When he mentioned in his Aqidah, his book, where he, where he transmitted the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, he said, Usul Sunnah indana. He said, The foundation of the Sunnah, the foundation, the root of the Sunnah, the root of our Aqidah to us is two things. Well, he mentioned many things, but the first thing he said, Atamasuku bima kana alayhi ashabu Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is to hold on to what the Quran is which was the Quran and the Sunnah. So to hold on to the Quran and Sunnah, well, iqtida'u bihim, and to follow them. So then, the sunnah is based upon two things. The haq is based upon two things. Number one, the source, the fountain, which is the Quran and Sunnah, and the understanding of the Quran and Sunnah, which is the companions of the Prophet. And that's what we should, we should train our minds to start judging the truth based on its merits, i.e., its textual value. Its textual value. Do you see? And I think yes. that will make things easier for a lot of people. Do you have anything to mention that, Sheikh, before we conclude? No, I mean, uh, you've, you've said it, uh, you've said it nicely. And I just want, I would add, 
And if that entails that you become a stranger, then so be it. Uh, you might become a stranger among your family. You might be a stranger in your community. You might become a stranger at your work and uh, your office. Uh, technically speaking, you, this, uh, this may result in you becoming a stranger, but this is a praiseworthy uh-huh. type of strangeness. Uh, and then uh, now we should be gentle because uh, we, we make a distinction between when, when we go and refute someone who's, who's misguided the Muslims and then our communication uh, with others. Just because we're trying to promote uh, adherence to the sunnah, it doesn't mean that I walk around my office at work and I'm, I'm you know, frowning everybody, hey, hey, this, hey, you stop, this against the sunnah. That's not the way of the salaf. That's not how it works. In our communication with people, we take them on the side, invite them to a cup of coffee, we have a nice talk. Uh, you know, we try to share the message in a beautiful way, in a gentle way. For the most part, there are times when you have to be a little more strict, but for the most part, that is the way of the Sahaba, that is the way of the Prophet ﷺ himself. And, and I'm not saying, so when you say become a stranger in, in the negative connotation uh, aspect of being strange, rather in the, in the ultimate positive way, including emulating the Prophets who, be, who were strangers to their people when they told them, La ilaha illallah. And then we have, you know, uh, many ayat from the Quran where the people said, are we supposed to leave our gods uh, and, and, you know, believe in la ilaha illallah? إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا إِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ وَيَقُولُونَ إِنَّ لَتَارِكُوا آلِهَتِنَا لِشَاعِرٍ مَجْنُونَ It is whatever it was said to them, la ilaha illallah, they would become arrogant and they would say, are we supposed to leave our gods for some crazy poet? That mentality is, is everlasting in mankind. Uh, unfortunately among the Muslims and among the non-Muslims. So you approach mankind in this manner. If people thought it was crazy to say la ilaha illallah and how are we going to abandon our false gods, then you can expect them to think you crazy for saying that this is the way of the prophets or that the Quran is preserved or that we follow the way of the Sahaba or any, any aspect of the religion that puzzles the people today Something more basic than that puzzled the people back in the day. So it's just, it's different, different eras, but it's the same principles. Kufr has always been around since the time of Nuh until the end of time. It will not go away. Our job is to be among those from the 1000 to be that one person whom Allah Azza wa Jal will select to go to Jannah bin ghayri hisabin wa adab without any accountability and without punishment. And for us to be that one person, you can't just be the average, uh, you know, Muslim for the most part, following everybody out there, listening to everybody out there and practicing the religion in, in the most practical way to you. It, it, that doesn't cut it. Allah Sahih. might forgive a person and put them there anyways. Alhamdulillah, this is from the mercy of Allah. But that is not the criteria Sahih. for salvation. Uh, for salvation, we have to make some, some serious effort for, for it, inshallah. Thank you so much, Sheikh. Well, I really benefited today and I think people really benefited as well, mashallah. It was a pleasure to have you. Really appreciate it. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. Thank you so fiq. much. Thank you. So, uh, much. so uh, just, and, and maybe for those who don't know, I'm, I've known you for many years, Akhi Barakallah Fiq, and I'm, I'm guessing you're going to put it in the uh, in the video. So, uh, if you want, because I've addressed all these topics yes, yes, uh, over the years, uh, the One Way to Paradise. So, basically, check mm-hmm. out the YouTube channel, One Way to Paradise, or the Facebook, One Way to the Paradise. Link. We'll put the link right um, here, inshallah. Hey, Barakallah Fiq. So you can become familiar with with all these discussions and, and how they've progressed and some of the things that we've basically mentioned so many years ago. And subhanAllah, we see their materialization today, especially the modernists. You will see how it's how it's materializing day by day. Sahib, so because, we ask Allah to protect us and make us among the righteous people. Allah Barakallah Fiq. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Subhanakallah. Thank you Thanks for watching this video. Subscribe and click on the notification bell. Like, comment, and share with friends and family.